So we're, we're into the last stretch here. Uh, we have about an hour. Um, we're going to wrap up. So I guess I should get started. Um, so we've seen these slides before, and now we're going to look at artificial neural nets for another facet. So we're actually getting moving from flowers to real bioinformatics. Um, so this is um, about secondary structure. And the reason why I'll be talking about secondary structure um, is because this is actually one of the first applications of uh, machine learning to the field of bioinformatics. So historically, it's important. Um, I can remember as a young uh, graduate student reading about um, the application of neural nets. Um, I think it was in 1988 to secondary structure prediction. Um, and that was one of the first applications of artificial neural nets to anything in, in biology. And it became kind of a hot topic, at least for a number of years. Um, neural nets, deep learning, and other things have, have continued to be important for sequence analysis. And tomorrow we'll learn about how you can use neural nets and feature selection to do gene prediction. Again, it's just for treating sequence data as, um, as useful input data. Uh, we're going to look at a secondary structure, ANN, so SAN is how we're calling it, and we'll explain the code just like we did for uh, the iris flower one. So just for background, because um, not too many of you, it sounded like from your introductions, were involved in, in protein work. More of you are involved in uh, genomics, genetics, metagenomics. Uh, but proteins are important, um, and they're polypeptides. They're made up of amino acids um, that have connections to amide bonds. Um, those amide bonds, which are characterized by the NHCO feature, are actually, they form a, almost a planar bond. The carbonyl oxygen forms a double, pseudo-double bond here, and it creates a plane. And that's illustrated here with these green lines. And about these planes, you have a pivot point, which is the alpha carbon, which is where my arrow is pointed. And this is how polypeptides can rotate or bend around this alpha point. Um, we have what's called a phi angle and a psi angle that is also used to define the rotation of polypeptide chains. And to some extent, you can think of a polypeptide chain as almost like a, um, a real chain, a metal chain, where this is a link, this is another link. And although they're not overlapping, they can pivot about that point with certain angles. So when polypeptides pivot about the phi and psi angle, they can um, start forming um, regular structures like uh, alpha helices and beta strands. So generally, once a protein or polypeptide gets above 40 residues, there's enough, I guess, hydrophobicity, if you want, for a polypeptide to start to fold. And um, from the primary sequence, which is the, the primary structure, which is the sequence, you can then have those secondary structure elements. There's a helix here, and there's a pair of beta strands there. These secondary structure elements can then assemble into forming a tertiary structure. That's the three-dimensional fold. This is what alpha fold solves. And then you can also have quaternary structures, which is might be uh, heterodimers, heterotetramers. Um, this is an example of hemoglobin, where it's a tetramer of um, hemoglobin monomers. Um, and so we have different levels of protein structure. And uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges was how do we go from protein sequence to 3D fold. Now do we go from protein sequence to secondary structure? So uh, one example of a secondary structure is called the beta sheet. And this is where you have polypeptides that uh, exhibit strands where they have hydrogen bonds shown with dashes here connecting NH and CO groups. And so atomically, the chain model looks like this. It's called the ribbon diagram typically draw arrows uh, to indicate that these have sort of a flat feature. Helices, um, if you get a hydrogen bonding between the first and the fourth and the eighth residue, 
in sequential sets, you'll form a, a coil or a spring-like shape. That's called the alpha helix. It's a characteristic right-handed structure. And then as you assemble multiple sets of secondary structure, helices, beta strands, coils together, they'll collapse into a tertiary structure. And you can have proteins that have a mix of red helices and yellow beta strands. You can have proteins that are all beta strand, or you can have proteins that are all helical. So this is called an all helical fold, an all beta fold, a mixed alpha beta fold. Many all helical proteins are things like cytochromes and hemoglobins. They have heme carrying capacity. Um, many all beta proteins are related to immunoglobulins and have some kind of immune capacity. Many enzymes are a mix of alpha beta. Those are just very general rules. So secondary structure not only was one of the first areas where machine learning was applied, it was also one of the first areas where bioinformatics emerged. So uh, many of the first algorithms, programs, tools, databases were about um, proteins and their secondary structure. And it was a case where only three or four protein structures had been solved by the 1960s. Uh, but people had noticed that there were regular features that proteins had uh, characteristic uh, abundance of helices. Some were a mix of beta strand. Certain residues were found in helices where other residues were more abundant in beta strands. It's been a subject that's been written about for you know, 60 years. There are books on it. There are thousands of papers on it. And people have used it, and even AlphaFold uses it to help with the prediction of 3D structure. It's how people have done things like protein threading, how they've done an assessed sequence to structure prediction. And really, um, it's the reason why I got into bioinformatics. Uh, I was doing a summer rotation using circular dichroism to evaluate uh, changes in protein structure. And what circular dichroism does is it measures secondary structure. And I was fascinated how you could get that information from um, both sequence data and spectroscopic data. So uh, secondary structure prediction algorithms, uh, there's many types. This is a software program that has uh, six or seven different ways of predicting secondary structure. It has a consensus method. It uses a probabilistic one called the true Fassman method. Uh, Fassman actually was a Canadian who moved to Brandeis and developed the first secondary structure prediction methods. Uh, the Garnier-Robson method, uh, which is using um, I guess elements of information theory, sequence homology, hydrophobic moment, other motifs. These allow you to detect secondary structure, in some cases quite accurately, uh, or predict it. The true Fassman method, as I said, developed in the 60s, mid 60s. Notice that there, you know, certain amino acids had high probabilities to be in alpha helices or beta strands. So alanine has a 1.42 probability of being in a, an alpha helix meaning it has a very strong helical propensity. Proline, P, has a 1.88 probability of being in a coil, whereas um, yeah, valine and um, probably that's the best one, has a 1.7 probability of being in, in a beta strand. So some have strong probabilities to be in secondary structures. Others have strong probabilities of being um, coil regions or unstructured regions. And this is just simply done by counting up their frequency in various secondary structures. And as we've learned more and more, that has a lot to do with the side chain, side chain propensities, and um, how proteins like to group certain clusters of amino acids or amino acid types together. So from the probabilities, um, people develop some very simple algorithms. Um, to basically scan a sequence. They would take a window of seven or nine or 11 amino acids, always an odd number, calculate the average helical propensity, beta sheet propensity, or coil propensity for all seven amino acids. So they, you know, each number, each amino acid had a number, um, average it over the seven and assign that value to the central residue. Uh, you do that for the helices, beta strands, and coil probabilities. And then you'd slide the window down by one residue, then you'd calculate the next 
probability and slide it in and slide it down. And the result would be a plot like this, where you might have um, red being for coil, green for beta strand, and blue for um, alpha helix. So you can see that there's a beta strand at the very beginning, the first seven residues. And you can see a helix is predicted, and then the coil region is predicted, and then a beta strand, and then a helix, and then a coil, based on the high, high probability values. So you're looking for peaks or things that are have the highest values. Um, and so this is how you would predict the secondary structure back in the 1970s. But um, with the window of seven residues, you're only measuring influence of other residues, three residues up or three residues back. Uh, it doesn't look at sort of the overall content of the protein in terms of how big it is, other residues further down. And that turns out that that does influence overall secondary structure for density. We also know that the probability uh, is not simply additive. Um, it's just a convenient rule and convenient way to calculate. There's some multiplicative features, there's some additive features. Um, it doesn't identify certain patterns because we know that there are um, variations in hydrophobicity, variations in charge coupling. Um, it doesn't include um, you know, additional sequence information from other similar proteins. That actually is also helpful. And then when they evaluate it on you know, real structures, it was only about 50% accurate, which is slightly better than guessing, but not a whole lot. So in the 1980s, um, people started using neural nets um, in one um, program called PhD, um, which was um, used by a student who was writing his PhD on secondary structure. So he called it PhD. Um, was published, and this was a, a big advance, and it used um, uh, essentially machine learning. So it was one of the first ones, but it also used multiple sequence alignments, which was also innovative. And it used the multiple sequence alignments to produce sort of a profile of amino acids. So it used neural nets, it used multiple sequence alignment, and um, it did very, very well. Um, this is how well it did in one example for helix and beta sheet and coil prediction. Um, and it's using a three-state prediction, not unlike the three states we talked about with flowers, with virginica, versicolor, and setosa. So B is for beta strand, C is for coil, H is for helix. And it's sort of like a multiple choice exam, except instead of ABC, it's um, HBC. Uh, let's say here's the confusion matrix. So you know you don't have a perfect zero on on uh, the di off diagonals, and you don't have a perfect set of ones on the diagonals. But you know some of the very best programs for secondary structure can get um, um, averages up around seventy five or eighty percent. So what we're going to focus on is you know how do you use artificial neural nets? to do secondary structure prediction. And this model is not really sophisticated because if we wanted to do something like that, it would be hours of explanation and coding. Um, but I just wanna show how, um, just like an ANN, which was used for flowers and classifying them can be used to classify residues as helical beta sheet or coil and to predict the secondary structure. So what you do with the same sort of thing is you have to have a training set. So with the flowers, we had 105 training sets. We have to also want to have 100 or hundreds or thousands of protein sequences where the sequence is known and where the secondary structure is known. And what we want to do is you know, upload sequences. I'm just using, um, I guess, exemplar sequences. This, this isn't real, but... It, um, of, we can pretend the proteins um, where we know the secondary structure or sequences that we have um, common motifs. Um, so in this case, this is alanine, cysteine, glycine, alanine. Um, we can run it through our standard neural net. And the idea is that for these six residues, then it would predict um, should have been six 
um, secondary structure units. So I'm going to move. Oh, that's six there. Yeah. Um, so that's a neural net. That's a schematic illustrating how we would do secondary structure. So the input is sequence. The output is a secondary structure. Um, and it, as I say, we would train on multiple sets, and we would obviously predict uh, multiple secondary structure elements. So we could do very similar things like we did with encoding. Um, we could do one-hot encoding or binary encoding so we can convert our sequences. In this case, it's A, C, and G is our total amino acid alphabet. We could have a, a window. We're just using a window of three just to make it easy to illustrate. And so we would write out our sequence as a vector of three by three, so three um, units of 0, 0, 1 or 0, 1, 0. And C would be 0, 1, 0. G would be 1, 0, 0. And A would be 0, 0, 0, 1. So there'd be a nine unit vector describing the sequence. And we could also encode what we want for you know, secondary structure. So Bs are 0, 1s, Cs are 1, 0s, and Hs are 1, 1s. So in the middle value here, we want the G to be predicted as a beta, or beta strand. So the input is this nine unit vector, the output is this two unit vector. And again, this is more hypothetical, but this is the concept, is you're encoding it, you have an input, and you want an output, and you have a data set that you can train on. So again, pretending uh, we've got our input vector, we've got some kind of weight matrix, and again, you have to match your weight matrix with the um, number of units that are going in. So if they're nine units in, you have to have a weight matrix of, of nine. Um, and then if you're wanting to have an output matrix of two, you'll have to have something that converts it to a, um, a nine by three to a three by two, which gives you your output. Um, and in our case, our output uh, vectors, we wanted zero, one with this random collection of, of weight matrices and thresholds, we get an initial one of 0.24 and 0.74. So we'd like the 0.24 knocked down to zero, and we'd like the 0.74 knocked up to one or closer to one. So we would, could do backpropagation, as we showed before, changing the first and the second layer. Then we do another calculation with the updated weights. And instead of getting uh, 0 0.24 and 0 0.7, we get 0.16 and 0.91. And as I say, you, you would do it for multiple iterations, multiple epochs. But at this point, you say, this is good enough. Um, or you could run it further and maybe get it down to 0 0.01 and 0.99. But that's where you could say this is converged. So this is a rough sketch of the type of math that you would be doing or the type of matrices that might be dealt with for secondary structure if you just had you know, a three-letter alphabet and um, three possibilities for uh, secondary structure. We could continue as we move down the sequence and modify the scoring matrices to get them general, not only just for predicting beta strands, but for predicting coils and other things. And again, back propagation is done. And eventually, um, you have enough um, weight matrices so that it's able to consistently handle sequence data and predict the likelihood of um, that little region of sequence to be a beta strand or a coil or a helix. And so it's just like the same weight matrix that comes out of the um, iris ANN. This is a, a weight matrix that would be used for secondary structure prediction. So uh, we can start with a real example, and we go through the same flow diagram as we always have. So our problem is, how do I predict secondary structure from protein sequence data? And then we need to find a good training set. This is a, a database that we created many years ago. Um, it's called the Protein Property Prediction and Testing Database, or like PowerPoint DB. But it's PPTDB, and it contains uh, protein sequence. Uh, with amino acids written above one line, and then the secondary structure written below that. 
So again, C's represent coil, B's represent beta strand, H's represent uh, helices. So this particular enzyme, mevalonate kinase, uh, has the protein data bank. The applied programs we wrote that then converted the PDB data to secondary structures. And we've done this for thousands of proteins. So what you can do is extract that data and create a table, which has um, the sequence name, sequence, and then the secondary structure corresponding to that sequence. And that's sort of our formatted data. So if that's our training set, that's our gold standard. These are known sequences with known secondary structures. And there's you know, thousands of them. And so we can now go and straight to this idea of how do we write a, a neural net to predict secondary structure. So you can look at the code that we've written. Um, as I said, if you've done that in the past, you can pop up the code and look at it. Or you can just watch the slides and I'll explain the code in a bit more detail. So we open the secondary structure ANN, it's the Python one. Um, I think we also have the R version. So this is central, this is the general algorithm. And we've given you the general algorithm for the decision tree for the irises, the general algorithm for the neural net for the irises. This is the general algorithm for protein secondary structure. So we have a read the data check for missing data, but we also check for invalid amino acids. Then we have to create our training and test set. And then we have to encode things. So just like we did encoding for you know, versicolor and setosa, we have to encode the amino acid alphabet, you know, 20 amino acids. We have to encode the secondary structure alphabet. So that's alpha, beta, or helix, beta, and coil. Uh, we have to encode um, the amino acids. So this is where we do one hot encoding. We also have to deal with the fact that we're trying to window our um, predictions. And rather than using a window of, of six residues or a window of seven or a window of um, 10, we're using, I think it was 17. Um, but if you're wanting to run a, set, a window of 17, you have to be able to run that window to the ends, the beginning and the end of the amino acid sequence. So you know, how do you have a window of 17 that can cover beyond the end of you know, residue one? So what we do is we pad fake residues um, at the beginning and the end of the sequence so that we can have a, uh, a window that runs from the very beginning. Um, and we do something called flattening, and I'll explain that. Uh, we'll have to do a secondary structure encoding and does in addition to the amino acid encoding. We'll have to use an activation function because we're predicting three states. Um, we have to use softmax. Just like before, we initialize our weights and biases. Just like before, we determine the number of batches. Just like before, we do forward propagation, calculate errors, perform backward pro propagation, update and iterate until our, we converge. So the algorithm is conceptually very similar to what we just, just did for the iris one, and hopefully people will see that. So for this one, um, we're not using some of the illustrative images. So we're just using NumPy and Pandas in this um, um, math function. Um, we have a, a, a different read function, but we have, again, pandas read. Um, um, and so we're taking the data CSV, and then we're also um, using the data structure um, with the location I log. We're using a um, slightly different script um, to check to see if we've got standard amino acids. So if we find something with the, the letter X, um, we flag that and indicate there's a non-standard amino acid. Uh, we can either remove it from the sequence or flag it as a sequence that um, needs fixing. Um, so ones that have any non-standard amino acids are ultimately removed from um, the data set here. <clears throat> 
um, we'll look for missing values. And again, the data is somewhat similar in terms of, or at least the program structure is somewhat similar for the missing value checks and label checks. Um, so it just flags things if it finds it. If it doesn't, it says everything is fine. The same bit of code, although slightly different in uh, format, to identify um, training and testing. Now in this one, I'm trying to see if it was a seven, yeah, it's, should have been 30% and 70% rather than 20%, but um, whatever, uh, that was a typo. But um, we have um, 710 proteins that we chose. And 70% of those um, count 493, that's the training, and then the test set would be 30% of 710. Um, this is where the one hot encoding is done. So you'll recall how we did the one hot encoding for flowers with 0, 0, 001 and 0, 010. 0. With amino acids, we're dealing with um, 20 amino acids. So there's going to be a, a matrix that's 20, but because we also want to include a null amino acid, which allows us to put eight or nine amino acids at the beginning or null amino acids at the beginning and eight or nine null amino acids at the end of the sequence. Our vector is actually going to be 21 characters long. Um, so we're converting A's and C's and D's into zeros and ones. You can see that the data at this level is very sparse. It's mostly zeros. And this is why um, the concept of embedding uh, became popular, especially in secondary structure. Because when you're trying to take a window of 17 amino acids times 21, um, a vector of 21 units, you're getting enormously long and wastefully empty um, data sets. And that affects the performance of the program. Uh, we can do one-hot encoding of the secondary structure. And this one is sort of trivial. It's just like how we did the one-hot encoding for the iris flowers. Um, we have to create an encoding for the amino acids. Um, and um, that's so just defining the codes and taking um, the zeros and ones, a binary number for those. And then the secondary structure alphabet for these C's and H's. So that goes back to the 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 that we talked about before. That's the conversion. Now, I'd mentioned that the original true Fassman algorithm used a window of seven, maybe sometimes nine. Um, as more people did work in the area, they found that the best window was about 17 residues. Um, and that's because there's interactions between neighboring residues and sometimes across residues. So we're going to be using a window of 17 and the, the ninth residue, the middle residue in this window is what we predict. So if we have a sequence, a protein sequence that begins with PKP, da da da, another 300 residues and ends, um, we're putting in null residues. Um, put in nine null residues at the beginning and nine null residues at the end. And that allows us to predict or um, estimate what the secondary structure would be in the first um, few residues in the sequence and the last few residues um, using a window size of 17. Um, so here I haven't drawn a 17 residue window size, but we've just got one, I don't know, was it 11 um, residues? And we're saying, here's this window um, for this, the middle residue, which is E or glutamate, predict what secondary structure it should be. And in this case, it should be an H for a helix. So you're calculating the output for the amino acid at the center of each window. And then you slide that window down, calculate it again, give an output, slide it down, analyze, give an output, and so on. So this is just showing how we shifted the window 
from the center of E to a center of P. And this is how we can convert amino acid sequence into secondary structure. Um, so we have, in this case, uh, two, four, six, eight null residues at the beginning of this sequence. And then the sequence begins with isoleucine, glutamate, 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 leucine. And so we can encode each of the amino acids with these vectors that are measured as 21 um, numbers long with mostly zeros, but occasionally a few ones. So if we have a sequence of 17 residues, eight nulls and nine other amino acids after that, that's the window that's drawn with the box. So the window is 17. And then if we have 21 um, elements in each amino acid, um, one hot encoding, we'll have 21 times 17, which is 357 pieces of information. And what we're doing is something called flattening, where we take those 17 by 21 um, arrays or matrices or tables. And we make that into one very, very long vector of 357 bits. So that's this is called the flattening. So I don't have space to put 357 characters on a on a single line in a PowerPoint slide, but that's essentially what we're doing. So that whole window of 17, including null amino acids or others, is, is flattened. And then we do the same thing and we create another flattened vector for the next residue. So we went from isoleucine, move it down, and it's now centered around glutamate. And we calculate that flattened vector again, and then move to the next one, and then the next one. Um, so we complete the sequence and create these massive vectors, each of which is 357 units long. And it's over the entire sequence of the protein, which is, let's say it's 200 residues. So you're dealing with a, a really massive table or matrix. And this is sort of what it's showing if you want. So that's our input data. So let's pretend we've got a 200 residue protein sequence. Uh, we have each of those windows. Um, so L is the length of the sequence, but each of these windows is 357 bits. Um, and we can have however many we want. And then we have an output data, which is a secondary structure. Um, and that obviously isn't dealing with vectors that are as long, they're just ones and zeros. Um, so we've got the windowing method. So this is just putting into code what I showed in those um, slides, where we've got the you know, window size. Um, we're using the alphabet, null size. We have null padding for um, um, residues that are beyond the front of the sequence. Um, this is padding at the beginning and padding at the end. Um, and then we start taking the window and start doing the flattening process, which I described. So we're now creating these vectors that are 357 units long, and we go down through the entire sequence. Um, we do another encoding for a secondary structure. That's how I described before with the table. This is just putting it into Python um, so that we can see how it's done. And with our encoding, uh, we can now start training our neural net. So we have uh, an input sample of 357 bits. So we have 357 inputs. There are three possible secondary structure outputs. Um, so we'll have a, a three output layer. And then we'll have a, a variable layer, hidden layer to deal with those things. Um, just like what we did with the um, iris one, we have to define our activation function. 
Um, and um, as I mentioned before, something that is derivatizable is essential for doing any kind of gradient descent optimization. So we've seen the math before. So the soft max function is used when you have um, something that has more than two categories. And the sigmoid function is used when you just have two categories, yes or no. So with the case of um, secondary structure, we're dealing with many more categories. And so the sigmoid or soft max function is the one that's required. Um, so we'll be using a soft max um, because we are dealing with classifying at least three types of secondary structure. Um, just as before with the artificial neural net with the iris, we can have initializing the weights and biases using exactly the same coding. Um, we've got hidden and output layers for both. And we can calculate the number of batches because we're trying to do mini batch learning, the same thing that we did for the irises. Um, and um, the same training loop and the same algorithm batch one, batch two, batch three, we do forward propagation, error determination, back propagation, update the weights and biases. We also have to have you know, the same issue about learning weight, batch size, epochs, um, and the same uh, piece of code that we used in the artificial neural net for, or this hit, uh, for the iris one is what we use here. Forward propagation is also very, very similar. Um, we have you know, it's a different window size and a different hidden layer size, but um, this is where we um, calculate the, the weights as we propagate and multiply going forward. Um, same sort of thing as we're going to determine the error and we have a desired output. We know what the secondary structure should be. We compare that output to what we predict and then we start tweaking the, the weights by going back um, and calculating sort of the derivatives of the cost function. Um, this is the same code and the same rationale that we used in the artificial neural net. It's, it's just the same concept of uh, changing from one layer to the next using the bias and the delta and the derivative um, with the cost function. Uh, we talked about how you, you have to differentiate. We've got a, a sigmoid derivative for some of these. Um, and we can also calculate the layer one weights, the layer two weights, um, layer one to two and two to one. Um, again, this is the same code that was used for um, the iris one. So not much different. Not much new. It's it's just how you do the calculations. Same thing whether it's updating weights or updating the biases. Those are all used. And um, just like we did with the iris one, we have this you know, identify your current batch, propagate forward through the first layer, propagate forward through the second layer, calculate the errors, um, perform derivative calculations as for layer two, then backwards to layer one, and calculate the layer one error, and update and bias your, your weights. This is um, some of the visualization software that we actually used. And that visualization stuff um, could have been added uh, to um, those, those libraries. And I don't know if we actually did for this one, but um, um, anyways, what you're seeing are um, you know, hidden units, changes with the epochs, and you're counting through. Um, we've shortened things, sort of we've compressed um, the units in terms of the number of bits, but um, you can see how weights are changing, and some are going positive, some are going negative. Um, we're looking at output units, so those are the three um, output units. But you can see all of the hidden input units and how much they're changing. 
Um, so I th this was done, I think, with Seaborn, uh, the Seaborn Library. Um, you can see the higher weights um, are darker the numbers. Um, and you can see that the positions uh, for some of these correspond to connections between different nodes. So each weight corresponds to a connection between each node in the graph. And what we're seeing is um, sort of these five hidden units and these three output units. So just with the um, same thing with the artificial neural network, with the iris, when we track the training output, we measure the error, we look at um, how that falls over time, whether it's settled into kind of a stable minimum, how long it takes, and, and how, how deep that minimum is. So um, in both cases, the programs are relatively slow because they have to do a fair bit. So we programmed in both R and Python, but the R code is many times more complex um, in terms of length whereas the Python one seems to be somewhat simpler. So from the secondary structure aspect, I mean, you obviously trained on this subset of, what was it, 490, and then you're going to test on another 250, I guess. Um, so we have the same um, training code for uploading things and comparing. We do an evaluation with the forward layer and we see what, what sort of numbers we get. Um, in terms of the number of sequences, um, there's about 7,000 in the PPDDB total. We had 497 for training, 213 for test. Um, lots and lots of amino acids, lots of secondary structure assignments. Um, so there was plenty of data to train from and we're very pleased with that. Um, this is um, what we got in terms of performance with the training and testing. So what you're most interested in is the diagonal and a perfect um, predictor would have got you know, one, one, one diagonal. Um, this one obviously didn't, um, but what is notable is that the numbers we got for the two testing and training um, are very, very similar. Um, you can just sort of do a visual comparison. And that indicates that, that the predictor was quite stable and not overly trained. Um, it was suitably trained. Now, the performance, as I said, is nothing to write home about. It's, it's better than true Fastman. Um, average is, I think, 61 or 62%. But it's not nearly as good as some of the uh, higher quality um, programs like PhD. And the reason why it doesn't do so well is because uh, it, it's not using um, embeddings. It's, it's instead using encoding information. It's not using multiple sequence alignment information, which is very rich in, in prediction. Um, and we had hoped to show how much embedding would improve the performance of this predictor, but fortunately we weren't able to get that done in time. Um, but overall, the fact that the training and testing are, are, are very, very close, the numbers are within a few percent of each other, certainly says that this is not an overtrained model. It's been suitably tested, suitably trained. So um, we have a program that works in Python and it can predict secondary structure. Uh, it's been trained on a large set and validated on a modest test set that we built. Um, you can do this for a variety, you use it for a variety of applications. And then I guess what we'll show now is how you could use it um, on, on a few examples. Now, depending on how much time people have, um, you can either do this for homework or you can do this over the next 10 minutes before we wrap up. Um, but again, you can find the software, the, the code um, under module four and click on it, click on the Google Colab. 
And as I said, take a look at the code. Um, there's a lot of it. Hopefully the explanations I've given are helpful, but it's sort of recycled. We're, we're largely using many of the same components that we used in the Iris artificial neural net, um, but with the modifications so that we're dealing with amino acid sequences. Um, to run the data, you have to set, take on what's called converted data.csv, not data1.csv. So you have to click on that and upload it as needed. And before, it's just all the other code that we've had, you can just choose um, under runtime, collect the run all to get the programs running. Um, I think it's important to remember that there's quite a bit of data that's read, and it's um, some very large data matrices that are generated. So this is inherently slower than the other programs. Um, but um, these are just sort of suggestions that you can do um, and how you can change um, certain parameters, data fraction from 0.1 to 0.12, how to run certain cells. Um, and so this is just give it a try. Look at what you can do to modify the code to see if you can either make it better or to understand how it works a little better. Um, there's another um, file you could use um, to get another type of test sequence, uh, with learning rate. Um, you can look at some of the plots and, and what that means to you. Um, so this is a relatively brief one in part because um, a lot of the same code was reused um, for the artificial neural net for um, the iris predictor. There's subtle modifications, but I think this is one of the things we wanted to, to show you guys is that once you've created either a decision tree or a neural net of some kind, you can reuse a lot of the code. And it's just a matter of how do you frame your problem or your data set so that you can recycle or reuse that code um, so as I say, we still have about five or seven minutes left if people wanted to upload that, um, those programs and just to go through some of those exercises. Likewise, if you didn't get a chance to finish the iris one, um, you can try that or get caught up on uh, other tricks and tips that you were learning. It's also a time to ask some questions if you have questions. 